keep silence, keep silence before him. Let's pray. Our dear Lord, we are humbled before your presence this Sabbath morning. We thank you for the spiritual blessings that you've given us. And we thank you for helping us and giving us another Sabbath. Lord, we are gathered here to listen from you. How we pray that may you speak to us in a special way. May you convict us of sin, of righteousness, and of coming judgment. Help us, Lord, that we may make decisions because your day is at the door. For this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Morning and happy Sabbath. Oh, good morning and happy Sabbath. I would like to welcome you to our divine service this morning, to our service, we'd like to welcome everyone who has uh, managed to join us. Uh, are there any visitors among us? There's always visitors. We greeted some. Okay, we have got some. Here, yeah, we don't struggle to let people speak loud. We have got uh, what we call this mic. If you don't mind introducing yourself. Uh, good morning and happy Sabbath, church. Happy Sabbath. Uh, my name is Ethan, and I'm here with my beautiful. <laughs> beautiful what? Uh, 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 no, ten, 12 days bride. Um, good morning. <laughs> Where, where, are, where are you from? Uh, so I'm from Birmingham, Perry Beaches. Okay. And thank you. I used to live in Preston, but we now live in Newcastle under Lyme. Amen. Amen. So you'll be seeing us more often thank by God's grace. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you don't mind, John? Give these two people in front there. Okay. <laughs> Good morning, church. Good morning. My name is uh, Eric Ondenga, brother to. Pastor Ondenga. Uh, we live uh, Somerset, Taunton. My wife can stand also. Uh, my beautiful wife. She okay. <laughs> <laughs> so while we were last Sabbath at uh, Taunton Church, they gave us greetings and said uh, when we'll be here that we pass our greeting to you. Do you receive our greetings? Yes. So do you give us greetings to take back? Yes. Sure. My wife can say hi. And this is our lovely daughter. And my son is there. So they will be staying here. Uh, soon or later, we shall join you back to Amen. Stockholm Trent. Happy Sabbath, church. Happy Sabbath once again. It's lovely to be here once again. Okay. This side. Right. Can, can I have my mic back? I've got. <laughs> right. Then there's another special visitor. Uh, does anyone know? I see some people are new here. They don't know that I'm married. <laughs> I don't think. Uh, yeah, because she, she has been working outside the stock for some time. So she has not been around. She has become a visitor here. Yes. Uh, my wife, Trader. Beautiful become, wife. She has become a visitor. She's going <laughs> to... Right. Okay, so when you see her, she's not a visitor. <laughs> she has just been working away from home. Okay, uh, we shall start, uh, start our service with uh, song number 625, Higher Ground, 625, Higher Ground. Uh, 
I'm pressing on the upward way. New heights I'm gaining every day. Still praying as I onward bound. No plans my feet on higher ground. Lord, lift me up and I shall stand by faith on heaven. Psalm 73, verse 24. Right, I will read. This is from New, King, New King's, uh, King's, King James Version. Sorry, It says, uh, You will guide me with your counsel, and afterward receive me to glory. May the Lord uh, bless the reading of his word. Right, this time we'll call upon, I think we need to change this. We call upon Elder Maponga to give us the main prayer. Elder Maponga. Let us pray. Oh God Almighty, our Creator. You are so loving and forbearing despite the mistakes that we make. God guide us, give us counsel, all instructions necessary to help us get to heaven. We want to see your glory as a church, Lord. Help those wishing to go to heaven get the right counsel today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. 
It's time for tithe and offerings. Um, where was I now? Sorry. Time for tithe and offering. I will read from Psalms 15, I uh, thought John 15. It's not the one, sorry. Okay, it's Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9 and 10. It says, Honor the Lord with all your possessions and with the first fruits of your increase. So your, bra- your barns will be filled with plenty, and all your vats will overflow with new wine. Uh, it's time for tithe and offering. Um, I just want to introduce something. I think it's not. We have got uh, uh, what we call avenues where income church uh, into the church comes. We have got uh, through uh, cash as we are collecting now, and also uh, tight envelopes, tight and offering envelopes, and also we use uh, the church bank account. Uh, there is an app that has been developed, which uh, I, I, I forgot to, to give to Andy so that they can put it there. It's called Seven Me. Seven, the letter seven, the, the, fig, those, the figure seven itself, and me, M-E, in, in small caps. You go on your uh, app store or uh, Play Store, you download that app with the Seventh-day Adventist app that has been developed. And there's so many resources there. And there you can also um, create your account, uh, choose your church, Stock Church, Stock on Trend Church, and then you can uh, uh, give your tithe and offerings through that app. Uh, so there's an app that has been developed. It's called Seven Me. Uh, seven, not in, not in words, but in figures. Seven, then Me, M-E. You'll find that app which, is, uh, which has been developed. It has got other resources. Uh, like uh, quarterlies, they are there. Uh, Ellen G. White story uh, books, everything is there on that app. Everything is there, so that's where also you can uh, return your tithe and offerings through that app. Uh, as regards to other things like the, the card system, we are still fighting to get that, but it's becoming very difficult. There are other things beyond our control which we cannot uh, do, but we will try to find the way to get the, the card machine back, but it's very difficult. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we'd like to thank you this morning for bringing us here. We'd like to thank you for the blessings you have given to each one of us and being able, dear Lord, to return to you our tithe and offerings. Bless this tithe and offering as it goes around the world to prepare your people to get ready for their soon coming. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, it's time for, suppose, the children's story. Am I okay? Am I all right? Yes. Time for the children's story. And uh, there's a sister going to give a children's story. If all children will come here. Precious in his eyes, Jesus loves the little children of the world. Hello, children. Hello. Happy Sabbath. Who's happy today? Are you sure? Why are you happy? Because it's, because it's Sabbath. Wow, he's happy because it's? 
Sabbath. Yes, why are you happy? Because it's the seventh day. Because it's the seventh day of the Lord. Why are you happy? Uh, uh, um, um, Sabbath. Wow, because it's Sabbath. And lastly, why are you happy? I'm happy I'm happy because I get to learn about God. Wow, he's happy because he gets to learn about God. And for our big children, why are you happy today? Because you're not working today, yeah? That's true. <laughs> In this country, when you get a day off, you're like, oh my God, yeah, I'm happy. But to be precise, we are happy because it's the Sabbath of the Lord. We get to rest under his feet, right? Yeah. Who's going to pray for us? Wow. Amen. All right. So we're going to pray. Thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you for the Sabbath. And as you're going to listen to the children's story, we pray that your Holy Spirit may be with us and guide us. For it is in the name of Jesus, we do pray trusting and believing. Amen. How many of us know Hannah from the Bible? Hannah, who's Hannah? Um, he ha- she had um, um, a boy who called Samuel. Yeah, she was the mother of Samuel. But before, Hannah didn't have a kid, right? And she prayed years and years, year in, year out. She was desperately praying for something. And that thing that she was praying for was a child. And to be precise, a baby boy. I don't understand why, but... She was precise. She wanted a a son. She was a very faithful servant of God. How many of us have ever prayed for anything? Myself, I know I've prayed for something. Little kids, what have you ever wished to get from God or maybe your parents? Yeah? I wish I can get a puppy. He wishes he can get a puppy. Who else has a wish that you may want to pray for? Our parents are listening. He wants a puppy. I wish I I can have a kitten. She wishes she can get a kitten. And for the big babies, do you have wishes? Everyone has wishes. Do you pray for your wish or your needs? Let Let me call them needs. Do you usually pray for them? Are we faithful servants of the Lord? Are you sure? Do you serve the Lord diligently? Because Hannah was a very, very faithful servant of God, but she prayed years. The Bible is precise. She says, years in, years out. Not days, no weeks, no months, but years. But for most of us, we dismay. We pray for one week, then we're like, "Hmm." God doesn't want to listen to me. God doesn't want me to get a puppy. God doesn't want me to get a kitten. God doesn't want me to get a wife, or a husband, or a job, or maybe a visa or anything, or maybe school fees, or maybe even good health. Yeah? You're like praying years in, years out, then you dismay. But the Bible encourages us that. Hannah prayed years in, years out, and finally, God answered her prayer. And she gave birth to baby who? To Samuel. She never dismayed. She never gave up. So you should not give up. Continue praying. And God will grant your wish of getting a puppy. Good. Don't give up. God will grant you a wish of getting a kitten. A kitten. Yes. And for our big children, don't dismay. God will grant you the wish of getting whatever it is that your heart desires. May God bless you. Who's going to pray for us? Let me pick. Are you going to pray for us? Oh. Choose between the two of you. Who wants to pray more? Choose. Come on. One more time. He, pray, he prays. <laughs> He's gotten scissors, right? All right, pray for us. Dear, dear Father, thank you for this wonderful children's story. Thank you for this day. And thank you for all the days. And Jesus name I pray, amen. Amen, thank you. As we go home, may we contemplate 
every desire that we want, every need that we want. Let us pray faithfully and diligently, and God will surely answer our prayers. Be blessed. Our preacher today is Brother Daniel. I think he has spoken to us before, but before he stands up to preach, uh, let us sing the song that will cheer us by the way, because in a little while we are going where? Number 626, in a little while we are going home. Shall we all stand, please? Let us sing a song that will cheer us by the way. In a little while we go, we go. For the night will end in the everlasting day. In a little while we go. We shall meet at last when the stormy winds are past. In a little while we're going home. We will do the work that our hands may find to do. In a little while we're going home. And the grace of God will our daily strength renew. In a little while we're going home. In a little while, in a little while, we shall cross the billows foam. We shall meet at last when the stormy winds are past. In a little while we're going home. We will smooth the path for some weary way one feet. In a little while we're going home. And may loving hearts spread around and influence sweet. In a little while we're going home. In a little while, we shall cross the billows fall. We shall meet at last when the stormy winds are past. In a little while, we go. To where we're going home, and our tears shall fall in that city bright and fair. In a little while we're going home. In a little while, in a little while, we shall cross the billows. We shall meet at last when the stormy winds are past. In a little while we go.
may be seated. God is good. Abi Sabbath. Abi day. Indeed, it's a happy Sabbath. And uh, we thank God for his care and for his provision. He has kept us for the six, week, six days. And in his own good plan, he has given us another Sabbath. And the Bible says that God cannot gather his light in vain. So the purpose for which that he has gathered us today, I believe that he's going to fulfill it. Uh, I saw people were introducing their... <laughs> so I, I also have a, a wife. <laughs> yeah, you know. Everywhere I go, people call me young man. Yeah, and I really don't like it. <laughs> yeah, because I'm a husband. Uh, I'm a father. Amen. Yeah. Amen. So, uh, I wish to be recognized as a father. <laughs> Not a young man. Yeah. So, may my dear wife uh, stand and say hi. So our name is Gladys. Okay. So may we pray. Our dear Lord, once more, we are before your throne of grace. Sinful as we are, weak as we are, helpless as we are, Lord, we pray for mercy. Lord, may you look upon us with favor. This day, your children are gathered, seeking to hear a message that will give them hope, seeking to receive encouragement from you, Lord. I am your servant, but I'm a man just like them. I pray that, Lord, may you lay my glory into the dust of the earth, that, Lord, in its place, the cross of Calvary may be lifted that Jesus may be seen hanging on the cross of Calvary, that Jesus may be seen interceding for sinners just like us in the throne in heaven. Lord, we pray that as we listen to thy message this morning, may the words be from you and only from you. Lord, may I not be seen, not I, but you, Christ, be heard, be seen. And Lord, may you use me just as a vessel to pass that message for which you've gathered your children here today. And as you've promised in the book of Isaiah, that as rain comes forth and waters the earth and causes the plants to grow, that your word can never return empty. Lord, I pray that the seed that will go forth from your word may it also germinate and bring some good harvest in its due course. For all these things we ask, believing and trusting in the mighty name of Jesus, our intercessor and our Savior. Amen. Amen. Yes. So uh, our key text has already been read. And... Um, it is uh, Psalm chapter 73 and uh, verse 24. Uh, Psalm chapter 23. Yeah, Psalm chapter 23 and uh, verse 24. And I wish us to Read that verse once more. Psalm chapter 23, verse 24. Yeah? Oh, 73. Sorry. Psalm 73, verse 24. And um, 
allow me lead from uh, my version, New King James Version. And the Bible says, you will guide me with your counsel and afterward receive me to glory. But our, key te our main focus today, in line to that verse, will be from the book of uh, Psalm chapter 8484, from verse 5 through verse 7. That will be our main focus today. Psalm chapter 84, and then verse 5, verse 6, and verse 7. And our, um, top, our theme today is the valley of Baca. The valley of Baca. So, kindly may somebody read for us that verse, those three verses, Psalms chapter 84, verse 5 through verse 7. And our theme today is the valley of Baca. Yes, somebody please. Thank you very much. When you read through the book of Psalm, you read a lot of Psalms. Some are full of encouragement. Some are full of uh, agonizing. Some are uh, songs of meditation. Some are, some are um, psalms of uh, some important decisions that somebody has made. Some are psalms of uh, supplications and prayers. And there's even some, some psalms in the book of uh, Psalms, they speak of the heart's longing for something. And today, When you read through Psalm, uh, when you read uh, Psalm chapter 84, in line with the verse that we've read, and other many verses throughout the book of Psalms, you will discover that desire of the psalmist, David, alongside the co, the co workers who wrote the book of Psalms, you realize that these people, they also had challenges like us. They also had some longings, just like we have. And also, they also desired the presence of God, just like we do. But especially today, I want to speak to us concerning the three verses, and we want to discover this value of Baca. What does it mean? When you read in the book of Psalms, chapter 84, which has been read to us, verse 5, the psalmist says that blessed is the man whose strength is in you. The you in this context refers to who? When you read verse 1, he says, How lovely is your tabernacle, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs, yes, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. So in uh, verse 5, when he says, Blessed is the man whose strength is in you, the you in this Verse refers to who? It refers to the Lord. In other words, I know in your versions it may say that blessed is the man whose strength is in the Lord. In other words, blessed is the man 
who does not trust in his own strength. Blessed is the man who knows that without God he can do nothing. Because when you read the Psalm chapter, Psalms chapter 1, it says that blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord. And he says this man is like a tree planted by the river, uh, the river banks that has grown and stretched its roots deep down into, into the waters. And then it says this tree can never, ever suffer dryness. It can never, because during summer, it, is, it still has supply of water. During winter, all the seasons, it has plenty of, of water at its, its disposal. So, the, uh, the psalmist says that blessed is the man whose strength is in you. In other words, blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord. And uh, it reminds me of the book of Nehemiah, chapter, I believe, chapter 8, verse 10. Whereby, Nehemiah says that the Lord is our strength. Our strength comes from the Lord. Meaning that without God, we can do nothing. We as Christians, we ought to reach a point where we lose trust in self and we start trusting in God. Because even if you have, even if you have the capabilities that you may think you have, it takes the hand of God for you to succeed. And without God, your strength is all in vain. Because the Bible calls him the, 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 the man, the, the, the strong, it, it, it speaks of God, of the strong man of valor. It's the Lord who is powerful, who is mighty in strength and majestic in glory. It's the Lord who is all sufficient. And if you accept him in your life, if you accept to seek strength from him, be sure the Lord will sustain you. Because in trusting self, you are building on sand. Remember what Jesus said of a man who built a house on sand. What happened when the storms came? The house was swept away. So, if you trust in the Lord, and if you put your strength in the Lord, you believe in the strength of the Lord, be sure when the storms will rage, when the winds will blow, your anchor will hold. You will not dismay. Despite the, 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 the raging flood, however hard the tempest may be, you will not be moved because your strength is in the Lord. That's why when you read in Zechariah in, in chapter 4, is it 4 verse 6, it says, not by mighty, not by power, but by my spirit. And the Bible says, so blessed is the man whose strength is in the Lord, whose heart is set on pilgrimage. In other words, yes, this person is trusting in God, and this person is on his way to somewhere. And as he's on his pilgrimage, he knows that without God, I cannot safely arrive to my desired destination. So this man, as he walks through the journey, he has that supply of strength from who? From God. That's why this man is blessed. As he's going through, on, as he's pressing on with his journey, He's seeking new supply of strength, new supply of comfort, new supply of encouragement from God. And then the Bible says, as they passed through the valley of Baca, 
they make it a spring, and rain also covers it. My friends, what the psalmist here is talking about is nothing but our pilgrimage on earth. That on this earth we are sojourners. On this earth we are passerbys. So as we pass through this earth, he likens it to the valley of Baca. He calls this earth the valley of Baca. And then he says that this man who passes through, uh, 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 who passes through, who is on his pilgrimage to heaven, passing through this earth, believes in God. And verse 7 he says, because they believe in God, they go from strength to strength until each one appears before God in Zion. I don't know whether you get those words. He says that blessed is the man who has set, who has, who, whose strength is in the Lord, whose heart is set on pilgrimage. And then he says, as they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a spring. The rain also covers it with pools. And then verse 7, it says, they go from strength to strength each one till each one appears before God in Zion. So what, what is the ultimate goal of this man? To appear safe in Zion. So, let me try to explain. When you set your heart on pilgrimage, it means your heart is set on a traveling mode. You have it in your mind that as you are passing through somewhere, that place is not your final home. That place is just facilitating your way as you march forward to your desired destination. So, in this context, the psalmist is talking about people on earth who have set their hearts on pilgrimage, looking forward to safely a life home in heaven. And then he refers to this earth as the valley of Baca. When we talk of Baca, most writers, they refer to Baca as a place of uncertainty, as a place of drought, uh, uh, drought, dryness, barrenness, tears, pain, sorrow, heartbreaks, death, all those evil things that you may think about, they are referred to us, Baca. And that is what this art is. This is an art that is full of uncertainty. This is a place full of fears. Fears from within, fears from without. This is a place of uncertainty. Right now we are, but the next moment we don't know whether we will be. Right now, we feel happy, you feel happy, but the next moment you don't know what state you will be in. Today you are celebrating, the next moment you are crying. Today you are very excited over the things that you have achieved, but the next moment those things look to you as rubbish. That is exactly what the value of Baca denotes. It denotes of people who are living, who are passing through a place of sorrow, who are passing through a place of pain, who are passing through a place of death, a place that has nothing that can attract the soul, a place that has nothing that can bring a lasting joy. And that is the earth in which we live. That's why when you read in Psalms chapter 82, verse 5, 
speaking of the value of Baka, he says in Psalm 82 verse 5, the last bit of it, that the foundations of the earth are shaken. The foundations of the earth are unstable. That is what my version says. Other versions say that the foundations of the earth are out of course. Don't you know that the foundations of the earth are out of course? In other words, we as Christians, we ought to set our hearts on pilgrimage. We need to have this pilgrimage or pilgrims complex, whereby as we live on this earth, we need to look at it as a place that is facilitating our passage, a place that is molding us for a better place. And therefore, we should seek strength from the Lord. That's why the psalmist says that this man is blessed. Yes, he's living in that valley of pain. Yes, at times he may pass through that pain. He may have painful experiences. At times, this pilgrim may cry. This sojourner at times may, may, may have it rough. But his strength is in God. And because his strength is in God... His strength is renewed day by day. And so the things that he goes through in this valley of Baca do not discourage him. These things excite in him a desire, a longing of wanting to get home sooner. And that is what this art should cause in our hearts. As we go through pain, as we go through heartbreaks, as we experience death, as we see our, our, our beloved ones die, it should remind us that this is not our final home. It should excite in us that desire of wanting to get home soon. Don't you know that those people of the Bible, the prophets of old, what encouraged them is the thought of a better place. And they desired to get to Zion someday. And because of that, the Bible says that though this world, world presented goodies to them, they refused. They looked at themselves as pilgrims and sojourners. When you read in uh, Hebrews chapter uh, 11, verse 8, through verse 11, Hebrews chapter 11, uh, verse 8 through 11. We read of Abraham. What do you think caused Abraham to leave his home? Do you think it's because of this land of Palestine? Of or, or the earthly place? No. The Bible says that when Abraham... Can you read that, please? We need to read the Bible. We need to read the Bible. It's not good for us. We need to read the Bible. Somebody, can you read or, uh, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8? When we talk of Abraham, Abraham had that pilgrim, uh, he, was, he had set his heart on pilgrimage. And that's why it was easy for him to leave his country, to leave his people, to leave his familiar places, to forsake his childhood home and start a journey to a place that he did not know. Somebody please read for us. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Put a pause. Elder, put a pause. Let's go slowly. We have read verse 8. Start, read verse 8. Okay. He went by faith. faith. Did he know where he was going? No. It says that he was going, <laughs> he went not knowing where. Do you think people were happy of him? By the way, let me, let me tell you, for example, 
If I tell my mother now, mom, uh, let me give you bye. I'm going somewhere. God has shown me, a he has told me to leave. I go to a place. I'm sure my mother will say I'm insane. I know. You will tell me, stop that rubbish. Yeah. So, can you imagine this person, this Abraham, it is saying that he was called to go out to the place which he could receive her as in, as in inheritance, an, an inheritance. He went not knowing where. He went by faith. And her verse 9. By faith, he dwelt in the land of promise as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob. By faith, he dwelt in the land of the promise as in a foreign country. Thank you, thank you. By faith, he dwelt in the land of promise. Uh -huh. Dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob. Okay, 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 okay. Let's go, let's go. Let's interpret the Bible. Verse 8 has said, by faith, he was called out to go to a place which he could receive as an inner inheritance. And then he went not knowing where he went, where he was going. And then when you go to verse 9, he says, by faith, he dwelt in the land of promise. So it is talking of an inheritance, meaning he set off by faith. And then it says that he dwelt in that land of promise, meaning if it was the earthly, uh, the earthly inheritance, did he receive all, uh, did he receive what he was on earth or did, or, or, or did not receive it? From two fast, those two verses. Did he receive it? If he did not receive, then what is this land of promise? Because it says by faith he dwelt in the land of promise. Which promise? All right. So, which means, by faith, he set out. And then by faith, yes, he received that physical land on earth. Are we together? Yeah. Now listen the next bit of it. Elder, read, read, continue, continue. Oh, no. Ten. You've oh. not finished verse nine. Okay, Leave. verse nine. The, 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 uh -huh. Dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. So he dwelt in tents with? Uh -huh. heirs, or, or heirs with him of the same? Uh -huh. Continue reading. 10. For he waited for the city which, was, which has foundation, whose builder and maker is God. Amen. So, though he received that physical land of Palestine, still, we are told that he dwelt in tents. Looking forward for a city that has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. In other words, yes, he received that land on earth, but his heart was on pilgrimage mode. Amen. He knew that though I'm living on this earth, this is just transitional. Someday, I will get that promised land. He caught the spiritual vision. And because he set out by faith, his vision was opened. He saw this land Yes, it was a, a land full of honey and milk, but still, when his vision was opened, he looked into the future. He saw this land plagued in blood. Even today, Palestine is still fighting. It's still a pool of blood. It's still, we hear sounds of ammunitions and... and, 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 and uh, uh, we hear of bombs, we hear of bad things. 
these things did not go well with him. He knew that though, yes, I've been given this place, but I don't want to live at peace here. I better take it as a token of the great inheritance that God will give me. So he was looking for a city whose builder that has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. That's why the psalmist says that the foundations of this earth are shaken. Because the psalmist knew, because Abraham knew that there is nothing good on this earth. And you know what the Bible says? That Abraham saw my day and was happy. When he set forth by faith to go and give his son as a lamb in the place as a sacrifice. And as he raised that knife, ready to take the life of his dear son, he was told to not touch that son. Because God provided a lamb instead of, yes. He was shown what Christ could come and do. He was shown that though this art, yes, it, may not, it is not good. It is full of sin. It is full of pain. It is full of suffering. Jesus will come someday. And when Jesus will come someday, he will shed his blood. And instead of us dying, God will spare us, just like he spared his son, Isaac. And this God is spiritual vision. And therefore he said, no, I don't want this earth. The Bible says he dwelt in tents. That's why when even they had a conflict with his nephew, he was able to let go. He told him, I, I just choose where you want to stay. Yeah, because he knew I'm just a sojourner. And this is not my final home. And you know what the Bible says? Abraham and many, many others. When you read in verse 13 of Hebrews, verse 11, it says, all, this all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. So the Bible says they all died. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and all the heirs and the patriarchs of old. The Bible says they did not receive that promise, that city which has foundation. But the Bible says they saw it from afar. And the Bible says that they embraced it. And they said that indeed they are strangers. And then verse 14 says, For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. Are you seeking a homeland? Are you seeking a place of peace? Are you seeking a place that is better than this earth? This earth is full of bloodshed. It's full of sorrow. It's, of, it's full of agony. It's full of tears. It's full of bullets. It's full of many things that dismay our hearts. We need to catch the spiritual vision, just like the men of old. And the Bible says that if we do, then like them, we will declare plainly that we are seeking a homeland. Because we cannot afford to call this place home. Yes, we cannot afford to call it home. Can you call home a place where there is no peace? Can you call home a place where only bad things? Most of the stories that you listen to or that you hear, most of the breaking news are not good news. They are sad news that break, break our hearts, that break our joy, that break everything that we cling unto. We need to catch the spiritual vision. 
and realize that this valley of Baca is not our home. It is a place that is doomed. It is a place that is out of course, as the psalmist has said it. And you know what the Bible says? In verse 13, in verse 15, it says that, and, tru and truly, if they had called to mind that country from which they had come out, they could have had opportunity to return. Verse 16, but now they desire a better, that is a heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. Yeah, so as we pass through this earth, we ought to come to a point where we count ourselves as strangers. We ought to come to a point where we desire a better country. And that will excite us. And you know, I told you someday that Ellen G. White says, if you don't think about heaven, definitely you will not be there. Because that which you think about, you look for it. You become obsessed. You need to think about heaven until you get obsessed of it. Until you think of it. When you think of its treasures, its gates of pearl, when you think of its, its streets of gold, when you think of the tree of life, that is, uh, when you think of that tree of life that produces 12 manner of fruits every month, when you think of all the descriptions that God has given us, they should help us catch that vision, and then we should feel homesick. Because when you read even, when you read in uh, uh, Philippians chapter 3 verse 20, he says that, verse 19 and 20, he says, our citizenship is in heaven, from whence we look forward for the Savior, who when he shall come, he will transform our lowly bodies to be like his body. Yeah, because if your hope is on earth, then you are doomed. Because all that you will have to enjoy in this life is pain, is that diseases, sorrow, anxieties, and many, many, many things. And then you die, your life is ended. But if you think of a better land, if you think, if you catch that vision, then it means you will become obsessed of heaven until you seek it. And even when it comes to the point of death, you will be able to rest with the promise that though I'm going down to the grave, someday I will hear the trumpet sound. And you know someday when Jesus will come, there will be a resurrection, whether you like it or not. There is the resurrection of the just, and there is the resurrection of sinners. The just will resurrect, and they will go to heaven for a thousand years, according to Revelation 20. And they will stay there with God. But the sinners, they will resurrect after their thousand years. And lo, they will resurrect with their feeble bodies. Sinners, oh, uh, the righteous, those who die like this uh, uh, men of old, like these pat patriots, when they resurrect, that resurrection marks the beginning of a new era. That resurrection brings an end to sorrow, an end to pain, an end to sickness. For the Bible says, that when we resurrect, we shall resurrect with new bodies. And it's not talking of uh, bodies like that, those of newborn babies. It's talking of bodies that are clothed in immortality. And when we talk of immortality, 
We are talking of a life that equates with the life of God. You resurrect not to die again. You resurrect not to feel sick again. You resurrect not to feel any pain. But you resurrect to enter into the joy of the Lord. And you know what the Bible says? The Bible says when they resurrect, when the righteous resurrect from the graves, they will resurrect and they will recognize Jesus. And they will say, indeed, this is our Savior, whom we have been waited, whom we have long waited for, and for sure he has come for us. And they will go home. They will go home. And when we set forth going home, the Bible says that Jesus and all heaven will come. When Jesus came the first time, he came alone. He came alone. But when he comes the second time, he will come with power, with his angels, and with the glory of the Father. And the Bible says he will come in power and in glory. And he will come with angels with him. Legends of angels, thousands upon thousands. That's why when you read in Revelation, the Bible says there was silence in heaven. Why was it there silence? Because all heaven has been interested in our salvation throughout these ages. And they have been patiently waiting for us to join the family of heaven. So when the resurrection morning comes, that final day, of resurrecting to join the family of heaven, the family that has labored so hard, the angels that who have been swift in executing the heaven-sent commands, or who have been on missions of salvation, who have been guardians of our souls, they will leave heaven, all the hosts of heaven, to come and receive us from the graves. And they will receive us clothed with immortality. And the Bible says we will go with God and we shall live with him forever and ever. Never more to test pain. Never more to die. Never again to die. Because the Bible says we shall be like him. And Paul speaking to Corinthians, he tells them that for we know not what awaits us, but we know that we shall be like him. It has not been revealed unto us how it shall be. But we know shall we, that we shall be like him. And he says, whatever that has been prepared for us, the eyes have not seen, the ears have not heard. Unless we be partakers, we shall not know it. So my encouragement this afternoon is that we have an heaven to win and we have Satan to shun. We need to catch that spiritual vision that we may become of obsessed of heaven, that we may set our hearts on pilgrimage. Because when the trumpet sounds, I tell you it is, gonna, it, it is going to be glorious. It is going to be glorious. 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 It will be glorious. I will not like to miss. Can you imagine missing the resurrection morning? And the Bible says, the saints go for a thousand years. What will be happening during the thousand years? The Bible says, there will be, they, will, they shall be, the, the referator says he saw thrones in heaven. And then he saw the judgment. In other words, in other words during the thousand years, the resurrected will be asking, where is my friend? I thought he was a spiritual person. And then the records will be shown. Your friend is not here because of this, this, this. A mother is asking for a daughter. A, a, a daughter is asking for a mother. Those questions will be answered. And then it says everyone will, be, will say, indeed, Lord, you are, your judgments are just. And then at the end of that millennium, Jesus comes down. And that even new Jerusalem descends. And the sinners resurrect. They resurrect feeble. They resurrect sickly. 
I'm sorry to say this. If somebody had taken cigarettes until he died of some cancers, when he resurrects, he resurrects that morning, he will not be any different than when he died. Because him or her, he will not resurrect with a new body. The new body is only for saints. It's only for those who received Jesus. So you resurrect in your feebleness. And when they resurrect, they resurrect just to realize too late that they have been lost. And when you read your Bible, in Luke chapter 13, verse 28, the Bible says, you shall cry when you shall see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in that city, and you yourself are left out. Yes, because we have read that the city is meant of transparent glass. When Jesus comes, we're going to see him. We're going to see them. And when you read the spirit of prophecy, it is very clear in the books of the spirit of prophecy. It is, gonna, uh, it is going to happen. And then you resurrect again to die. The second death. The second death. What a torture, what a pain, what a sorrow that we spend all these years and then we, we, we end up missing heaven. My prayer this afternoon is that God will help us, that we may, like Abraham, think of that heaven until we come obsessed of it. Amen. Because we read even of Moses, when you read in chapter 11, verse 23, it says that Moses... When he was become of age, he refused to be called Pharaoh's son. He chose affliction with God's people than enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. And you know what the Bible says downwards? It says that verse 25, 11, 25, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than enjoy the pleasures, the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasure in each, treasures in each pit. For he looked to the reward. He looked to the reward. In other words, his heart was set on pilgrimage. By faith, he forsook each pit, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. He never feared the wrath of the king. The Bible says he endured as seeing him who is invisible. We need to come to a point where we endure seeing he that is invisible. Yes, we may suffer pain. Yes, we may suffer sorrow. But as this man, we need to come to a point where who endure as sin, who that is in heaven. Can you imagine this? Let me finish with Moses. Can you imagine Moses? You know how he was born. The time which, in which the Israelites were oppressed and persecuted. The firstborn sons were killed. But the mother, because he, has, he had read of a Messiah, he thought that this seed might be that Messiah. They preserved that child's life, risking their lives in River Nile. But then God had a plan. By God's grace, that child was brought into the hands of his mother. And you read of Moses. He was, his mother was appointed by Pharaoh's daughter as a, a guardian as a caretaker. He took care of his own son, pretending to be a caretaker for 12 years. 12 years. Can you imagine what went through these 12 years? They thought, of, they, thought, they thought him of this promised land, of this city which has foundations. They told him of that promised land that someday we are going to inherit. That Eden that was lost by our parents, it is going to be reclaimed by Jesus. He caught the vision at the age of 12. He left his parents. He joined the palace. 
when he joined the palace, he again started another form of training. He was given the best military training. He received the best civil training. Until when you read Acts chapter 7, I believe, verse 22, the Bible says, now Moses was mighty in words and deeds. That's what it says. But still he had it in mind. Yes, I'm being trained as the next, I'm being trained as the next, uh, uh, as the next heir to the monarchy. But I am not of this monarchy. Because my monarchy is in heaven. And my king is Jesus. My, my king is, my Lord is, my God is my, uh, is my monarchy. It never attracted him. So for the next 28 years, he, was, he received that training. He was given the very best. The very best. Very best. Until when he was 40, because he had read that prophecy of around 400 years that the Israelites will be rescued, will come back to their land, he thought now God will use him. He started using his power. One day he found an Israelite and an Egyptian fighting. And then in his bid to save that Israelites, he killed the, 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 each, uh, the, yeah. The next day, he found two Israelites fighting. He went to tell them, we are brothers. The other one, who, one who had witnessed him kill the Ishvishan. He told him, you want to kill me the way you killed? This alone called, caused havoc. He ran for his life. In God's grace, he found himself in Jethro's house in the wilderness. He started tending the flock at the age of 40. He tended the flock for the next 40 years. And the Bible says when he was tending the flock, he had to unlearn. He learned meekness. He learned humility. Until when you read in Numbers chapter 12, verse 3, the Bible says, now Moses was the meekest person on the face of the earth. One who was arrogant now became meek. By tending those feeble or uh, looking after those feeble uh, animals, those some that you had broken uh, legs and the like, he learned lessons of humility, servantship, and other things. To cut the long story short, God took him to his school until he was eight years. And then now, at the age of eight, God comes to him and told, tells him, Now, Moses, I have heard the cries of my people in Egypt. I want you to go back and take them back. Take them to, that, to Canaan. And then, for 40 years, they wandered away the wilderness, around the wilderness. A journey that was to take them a short while. It took them ages. They go circles, circles in the wilderness, circles in the wilderness. Until it came a point where, until it came a point where one day, God told him, they come to a place, they lack water. They start crying, take us back. And then, God tells Moses, Moses goes to God. God tells him, go and speak to the people, speak to the rock. And it will bring water so that I may be glorified. And then Moses goes, because he was human like us, he strikes. And then, it is not the striking, it is the words he said. You people, for how long will you cry to me? Will you cry to me? He took the glory of God. And that is why he was forbidden from going to that canon that he had so worked hard for 40 years. So it came a time they are at the borders. They want to cross over to Jordan and they inherit that land. They had fought many battles. Moses, God told Moses, now prepare yourself. You are dying. Moses said, 
God, please. Please, Lord, you know how I've worked for you. Let me go and just have a look to that beautiful land, and then I will die. God told him, shh, keep quiet. Far be it that you speak that thing again. I said you will never go. Go, appoint Joshua and Caleb, give them the mantle. Start your journey up the mountain, for you will die. Moses went quietly. He was diligent to tell them, and even he reminded them of the incident that caused him not to see the promised land. And then as Moses is climbing up that mountain, the Mount of Pilsgar, he goes to the top. The inspired writings say, as he was climbing, he started meditating. He started thinking of how God has been faithful. He started seeing how God made them win many battles in the wilderness. How God fought for them. And then finally, when he went to the top, God gave him a vision. He showed him that land. He looked down from that hill. He saw that land of, uh, that, that land of Canaan. He saw it was green. It was blossoming. It was blooming. And then by faith, God showed him the Israelites successfully crossing over, settling down, having their vineyards, growing their grapes, enjoying their, uh, uh, the labor of their ants, and being successful. But then again, God gave him a vision. He, saw him, he showed him the Messiah coming. He saw Jesus coming. He saw the Messiah being born in that place. He saw the Messiah preaching the message of salvation. He saw Jesus hanging on the cross. And then, and then he saw the agony that it caused heaven. And then he saw the resurrection morning, how Jesus resurrected with power and glory. And then God still gave him a vision. He saw Jesus going to heaven. He saw the message being preached. And then he saw Jesus coming the second time and taking us to heaven. And then he saw that new heaven and new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven. And then he saw a new heaven and a new earth, a brand new earth. Moses was satisfied. And then the inspired writings say, he leaned to one of uh, uh, the rock to, 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 to rest, and then he died. Now, as we finish, listen, this is what happened. As Moses died, Satan was watching from a distance. So Satan kept, you know, Satan wanted to take his body. Yeah. But he was not able. God had a better plan. Moses was not. According to his vision, he knew that he would stay there until the second, until the resurrection when Jesus would come the second time. But God had a better plan. And this was the plan. It did not take long. Jesus was commanded, if we read Jude chapter 9, Jude 9, Jesus was commanded, and then he came down with angels to resurrect Moses. And then when Jesus came, Jude says there was a confrontation. Satan is claiming the body of Moses. Because Satan is claiming unto that sin that he did. But he didn't know that when you believe in Jesus, when Jesus forgives you, you are forever forgiven. And if Jesus, Jesus has power to give life, he has power to give a second chance. Amen. So as that, uh, uh, and the Bible says, Jesus did not argue. He told him, he rebuked him. And then Moses came out glorious, clothed with immortality. Moses went to heaven. And now, when Jesus needed encouragement, in the Mount of Transfiguration, Elijah and Moses. Elijah and Moses. Scholars say one had been there for 1,500 years, another one had been there for 900 years. Moses came to encourage us that we may be sinful. We may have had our own. But God is a God of a second chance. He came to assure us 
that there is a resurrection. There is a resurrection. Elijah was standing for those who shall be taken heaven, translated. So as we finish, I want to encourage us that as surely as you were born to this world, there is heaven. And someday, if you become faithful, Jesus will come and take you home. Amen. And there is nothing that will soothe the soul, nothing that will encourage us than to get to heaven. So every time when we sing, when we all get to heaven, may it be our prayer from our hearts that we really want to get to heaven. And if we really want to get to heaven, God will supply the grace. He will supply the strength. And we shall pray like the psalmist that God will guide us with his counsel. And afterwards, he will receive us to glory. Let us rise up. Sweet promise is given to all who believe. Let us sing number 600 as we close. Hold fast till I come. Sweet promise is given to all who believe. Behold, I come quickly, my Lord, to receive. Hold fast till I come, the danger is great. Sleep not as do others. Be watchful and wait. Hold fast till I come. men are praying that God may help us that we may not be distracted by this art and that we may set our hearts on pilgrimage if that is your prayer please raise your hand as we pray let us pray our dear Lord 
thank you for your message that has come unto us. We thank you, Lord, because you know us. You understand our weaknesses. You understand our strengths as well. You know how we have been assailed by the devil. You know to what extent our hearts are broken. Lord, you know to what extent the storm has raged in our lives. Oh Lord, how we pray that you who is able to hold us and to, to keep us from falling and to present us faultless before your Father, that Lord, please take charge of our lives. Lord, you is the guardian of our souls. You, who for the joy that was set before you endured the shame of the cross and died for us, we pray that, Lord, may you have mercy for us this day. Lord, we need mercy. Lord, we need grace. Lord, it may be that we may be the sorriest persons on earth. We may be looked upon with scorn because of the bad things that we've done in the past. But Lord, we pray that may you help us, that we may catch the fish on. That Lord, we may see you standing before the throne of heaven, interceding for us. Help us that, Lord, we may be conscious of the times in which we are living, that we may have a heart of understanding. Lord, we pray that the message that we have had today, that, Lord, we need to set our hearts on pilgrimage, that we need not to settle for this dark valley of back. Help us, Lord, that as Paul, we may forget that which is behind and stretch and look forward towards the mark of our high calling. Help us, Lord, that we may present our bodies as holy sacrifice, worthy of acceptance before you. Be with us, Lord, as we go to our homes. We pray that you may help us in our neighborhoods, that we may be able to set an example of what we profess and what we live for. We pray that, Lord, may you be with us now and forever. And may you still ignite this fire in us of desiring and looking forward towards that land. Above all, may we work out our salvation with fear and trembling. And, Lord, you is able to help us both to will and to do your good pleasure. Help us in that regard. We pray all these things, believing and trusting in the mighty name of our Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. May God's blessings be with you.